go ahead and be seated and if you will do it reverently because I want to see how many of you all in the house today believes that Jesus' way is better. Better than our way. So much better than our way. So much better than our way. Our way gets in the way of his way. Would you all agree with that? Well, haven't you all loved this new sermon series? Oh, just me? Have you loved this new sermon series? Well, how many of you guys want to know why I love it? I love it because I want to be right. Just ask my husband. <laughs> I love to be right. And just so you guys know, we're both pretty stubborn. He's more stubborn than me, and I want to be right more than him. So it's, it's a tough day at our house when he's being stubborn and I want to be right. We go round and around and around. And he always tells me when we're arguing, you always think you're right. It's because I am. And let me tell you why I am. Because I'm not going to argue something that I know I'm wrong on because I don't want to be wrong. So when we get in an argument, you better bet I'm going to win it. <laughs> uh, um, it's time that I believe the church needs to start debunking some of the things that people say that the Bible says that the Bible doesn't say. And that's what this sermon series is all about. It's making sure that what we're saying we're right on according to God's word. Pastor Rich talked um, some last week uh, about some of these things. He said, to know thine own self, that people give credit to the Bible for that, but it's William Shakespeare. <laughs> and how many of you guys have heard God works in mysterious ways? He does, but it's nowhere found in the Bible. Nowhere. And uh, next week, he's going to talk about and debunk the, the words that people say that money is the root of all evil. That's not what the Bible says. So um, make sure that you come back next week. But today, we're going to look at a scripture that is the most misused, misquoted, and misunderstood verses in the Bible. Judge not lest you be judged. That's the KGV version. You know, the King James version, the only version that my husband will read. And I'm like, no wonder you don't understand it sometimes, right? <laughs> oh, you guys, but I don't want you to get it twisted. How many of you ever pulled that scripture card when somebody comes to you and starts getting on to you for doing something that you know you're not supposed to be doing? Well, don't judge me right? We go, don't judge me. And we've pulled it, but that is as far as that truth goes. So today, I want to dig deep about what the scripture really means. The why behind the what about why it was even written. The title of my message today is, Don't Judge Me. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today. God, we are just so thankful for a worship team that prepares our hearts to receive the word. God, every word, every lyric, every uh, note that was played was just breaking down the walls of our hearts so that you can speak to us the way that only you can. God, I thank you for the Holy Spirit that convicts us and that teaches us. And I thank you that that's his job. Today, Lord, I pray for every single person hearing my voice and every person that watches it on YouTube and everybody that listens to it on the podcast that we understand that it is the Holy Spirit's job, not ours. So be with us today, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, right? Well, I was raised in church. How many of, uh, of you were raised in church? You got drugged to church every Sunday, Wednesday night. Pastor Rich said he was in church like seven days a week. 
I don't know, maybe five, <laughs> right? Five, eight days a week, okay. Uh, but I have been told my whole life, do this and don't do that. Go there, but you better not be going there. Can y'all relate? Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like there is no middle ground between Westboro Baptist Church. Y'all know who I'm talking about? The ones that stand on the street corner saying, turn or burn. You're going to hell if you keep doing the, living that lifestyle. There's no middle ground between that and the Unitarian, we are the world, acceptance. Where we can live however the hell we want and we're still going to heaven. We've got to come to the middle of that because there is a right and there is a wrong. And, and you guys, there is a heaven and there is a hell. And I can promise you that all of us will end up in one of those places at the end of our lives. So about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, I quit expecting to come to church and having a pastor feed me and tell me what the Bible says. I was like, you know what, I'm a big girl. I'm going to read the Bible for myself, and I'm going to let it speak to me what I need to hear. Because the Bible is living. And it says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it pierces our hearts so that it can speak what we need. And as I began to read, I asked the Holy Spirit to reveal truth to me. And guess what I learned? I learned that more Christians than not really don't know God's word. They take it out of context. And they don't know that you've got to love people to disciple people. The Bible was not designed to hit people over the top of the head and get them corrected. It is a book of love, a book of guidance, a book of grace and mercy to get us from this point today to another point. It's never to beat us up. Amen. And I believe that the way we present the Bible either pushes people away or it draws them close. One or the other. And you've all heard this. You may be the only Bible that anybody ever reads. 100% the truth. It, it, when, when people, I, I talk to a lot of people, most of the time that people leave because there's judgment. People are looking down their high horses, down their nose, judging someone else because they sin differently than they do. Let's look at today's key texts. If you'll turn in your Bibles, whether they're paper or they're, they're glowing, turn to Matthew 7, and it's going to be on the screen as well. And we're going to be reading verses 1 and 2 to start. It says, do not judge others, and you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. That's a pretty strong what statement, would you say? And did you notice that you didn't if you were watching on the screen, but if you were in, your, in a paper Bible or you're on a screen that glows, those words are in red. That means that they were coming from Jesus' own mouth. This isn't some pastor saying, you shouldn't judge. And No, Jesus said, do not judge because listen what, bro? Listen, sis. You do that, and what you're doing, you're going to get back and maybe worse. The why is just as strong because when we pass judgment, we're going to have that same judgment placed on us. So you better... I better, we better be very careful how we look at somebody when they're at their lowest point. Because it could be us in two weeks or two months or two years going through the very same thing. Or maybe something way worse. And God will give us back what we give. You see, when God judges 
and evaluates others. He knows everything. He knows our past, our present, and he knows our future. He knows our DNA. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our sin tendencies. He knows what our family went through that may have been passed on from a previous generation. And he knows a thousand other factors, as Ashley was saying today. He knows it all. But God's judgment is perfectly just. It's fair. Our judgment is terribly skewed, and it's based on our own paradigms. I think this is wrong, so it's wrong, right? I remember my paradigm BK before kids. You know, my kids will never throw a fit like that in public. My kids will never do that. I'll never yell at my kids. I'll not spank my kids. I won't ever, never do it. Well, then I had four boys. I did it all. I spanked them. I yelled at them. I lost my mind. And um, it was, I ate my words. How many of you guys have done the same thing? Yes. Yes, amen, yes. Well, um, I believe that judgment is a super slippery slope. Say that fast seven times. But as Christians, you guys, we do it all the time. We're constantly making judgments, judging someone else because they sin differently than we do. So often, our judgment lacks mercy. You know, if we're not careful, we're going to get back exactly that. Don't hear what I'm not saying, okay? Don't hear what I'm not saying. We can and we should call out sin. We should stand for righteousness and godliness, and we should fight for the weak and vulnerable, but we must, must, must do it correctly, and that's in love. In love. Oh, I know so many people that have done it incorrectly and it's causing people today in today's world and today's culture to say you know what I am a mess and I don't want to step foot in a church because I know they're going to judge me or there's people in church going I'm so tired of being judged that peace out and the sad thing is, is they're not just stepping away from people and religious folk. They're stepping away from the perfect one that can change everything in their life. So how many of you guys want to learn to do it the right way? Okay, good. Because I'm going to teach you. Um, the first way you do it is you have to do it in relationship. I think we do the biggest disservice when we do not have a relationship with somebody and we look down our high and mighty nose and we bring correction to somebody's life that we don't know at all. And then that builds a wall and it causes rebellion. So we can't be the Westboro Baptist Church with our signs telling people, if you don't change, you're going to hell. We have to lovingly be in a relationship to bring that. Second thing is you do it in love and with a pure heart. How many of you guys see somebody sinning and you go, oh, I can't believe they're doing that. Be honest. Okay, there's about seven of us in here that are honest. Great. Um, But make sure that you are sharing because you love and you truly want to help somebody. Too many times we love to bring correction because it makes us feel important, like we're holier than thou. The third thing that you have to do is, and this is something I've learned in the last couple years, ask permission to share because not everybody wants to take your advice. They might be looking at your own life and going, who are you? I, I was taught years ago, don't take advice from somebody you wouldn't change places with. You're not going to go to a dentist that has no teeth, right? You're not going to go to Haley uh, to work out if, if Haley's as big as a barn, right? We're going to go and get advice from somebody who is where we want to be. And listen, the last one is if you, your whole motive is to bust someone else's chops, 
All you're doing is hurting God's heart. So check yourself before you wreck yourself. There is a massive difference between judging arrogantly and judging with humility. I'm going to read you some examples. Arrogant judgment says, what a horrible, weak person. But humble judgment says, without the love and grace of Jesus, I would have already lost my salvation. I've been there before. As a pastor, I'm like, I'm about to lose my salvation. So we've got to be careful there. Arrogant judgment says, I would never do that. I would never sin that way. But humble judgment says, though A may not struggle like they do, that's not my vice. I failed Jesus 10,000 times over. Arrogant judgment says, I'm better than them. I'm holier than them. But humble judgment says, we both need Jesus. I've got my own junk going on. And Jesus said, do not judge others so you won't be judged as a gracious warning to us. He didn't do that for him. He did it for us. It was a warning for us. So, you guys, if we play judge, jury, and executioner, we're going to get that exact same treatment. The Bible says, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. My favorite description of Jesus is savage. Before you think I'm mean or crazy, let me explain. He loves like a savage. His love is unconditional. He keeps no records of wrongs. He forgives us, shows mercy and grace, even when we keep doing the same things over and over and over again, asking for forgiveness. He still loves us savagely. But my uh, favorite thing about savage Jesus being an Enneagram 8 is he barely tolerated the religious, a.k.a. folks. Let me tell you how he corrected them and the names he called them. Hypocrite, fools, brood of vipers, blind guides. Yes, they were the ones that knew the word, but they weren't living the word. They were pointing out everybody else's junk instead of looking at their own lives. You know, Today, they're the ones that are in church every time the church doors are open. They're praising and worshiping, and they're the ones that are acting holy, but maybe not fully holy. The Bible tells us that we're to look at, that, that we look at outward appearance. So when we see that, we go, oh my gosh, they just love Jesus. They're, they're so holy. They're so that. But guess what? Jesus looks at the heart and he knows what's in our evil hearts. And we all have places. And that's this whole message today. It is not to step on your toes to make you mad. It's to step on our toes to make us change. We have got to do better, church. I'll tell you, I told the refuge one night, they kept me up past my bedtime. I was here till like 1 a.m. And I I said, you know, I really struggle with church folk. Religious, not not you, big church, because you're not like this. But church folk that, that think they're so much better, that they have their stuff together. We're never gonna win people when we've got that kind of judgment going. Let's look a little bit further into our text and see some more savage Jesus. Matthew 7, three through five, and it says, Jesus, this is Jesus, words in red. He said, why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get that get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? own eye. Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. And you're my speck, log, mm, I need something. I need some more substance. So here are some examples. 
correcting a lie in someone when you're watching porn. Correcting someone struggling with substance abuse when you're gossiping to anyone who will listen. Correcting somebody that's a thief when you're sowing seeds of discord and complaining all the time. Hypocrites. The only way that hypocrites look at, they look at big sins and forget that their little sins is still sin. Jesus never put weight on sin. He didn't say this one's more and this one's less. No, sin is sin. So judging others helps no one. It might make you feel better about yourself for a little while, but it always comes back. You know, back in the day when I had very low self-esteem and um, no confidence whatsoever, I remember I judged people, not, not biblically judged, but I would see somebody that was beautiful and I would start nitpicking them, not to them, you know, because we never judge to the person, do we? Most of the time we judge behind their back. Uh, but I was like, oh, she thinks she's so perfect, but I see this. And, and for a fraction of a second, it made me feel better about me, but it was a fraction of a second. And then I'd feel bad about me again. That's why women especially, we've got to be each other's biggest cheerleader. We've got to love on each other and empower each other. And I, I, I'm saying that to women because, guys, you don't struggle with that at all. I mean, you don't compare yourselves and do all that. Uh, Y'all deal with pride. Um, but... <laughs> Um, but I'm telling you, when we judge, we're basically saying, Holy Spirit, I don't trust you to do your job. I feel like I have to step in and I have to help people get better. No, I don't want that job. I don't want that on me. I don't know about you. It's why our vision here at Big Church is to reach people that are far from God. Now, let me just explain, uh, a, a few months ago, people, there were some people that left the church and their reasoning was, we didn't go deep enough. And so, we kind of were like, oh my gosh, we got to do whatever we can to keep people in the four walls, right? No. God gave us the vision to reach people that are far from God. And when we stepped away from it, it did not work. So we're coming back to it and we're going to reach people that are far from God. And listen, if you need more, you know, do what God told me to do. Dig in your own word. Get off the milk. Quit being spoon fed and let the Holy Spirit, the teacher, do his job. Because he'll teach you everything you need to know. You don't need a man or a woman of God to feed you. Can you tell I haven't preached in a while? <laughs> I was excited to preach today. That's been a while coming too. Um, but what we should do, you guys, is come alongside each other in love. It's not judging to help someone to see their sin. It's judging when we condemn them for that sin rather than helping them, right? There's a big difference. You guys, I'm going to tell you a story. There was a time I sat across from someone who began to ask me a lot of questions and began to make judgments about me, Pastor Rich, and the church and how they thought it should be. And when I began to answer, I could tell that they were not receiving what my answers. And you know, uh, they went on to ask me, do you believe in righteous judgment? Of course I do. But can I tell you, righteous judgment doesn't come from a place of pride. It doesn't come from a place as I just can't wait to show you all, all the places you're wrong. It's done in Love. It was a classic example of somebody that needed to put down the magnifying glass and pick up the mirror and go, oh, baby, you've got your own issues, right? Listen to how the message version says this. 
I love the message version. Don't pick on people. Jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you when your own face is distorted by contempt? contempt. It's this whole traveling roadshow mentality all over again, playing a holier than thou part instead of just living your part. Wipe that ugly sneer off your own face and you might be fit to offer a washcloth to your neighbor. Now, when somebody comes at you with that ugly sneer, don't you just want to punch them in the face? Oh, just me and you? That's it. Okay. <laughs> Lord, <laughs> help me. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. <laughs> um, but you guys, all we have to do is study the Gospels, which is mostly Jesus' words, and we'll see that Jesus brought correction all the time. But it was with a pure heart, and it was done in gentleness and love. And he never monopolized on people's weaknesses. He always said just enough to challenge them, to want to work on themselves, right? Because when we come at people with judgment, they're like, wall up. But he would say just enough that they go, I want to work on myself. I need to work on me. They were coming up with it. You know, you do that with your husbands and wives. You do it with your wives. You, you, you make it sound like it's their idea, right? We do that to each other all the time. And I'm like, oh, great idea. <laughs> so anyway, I've got some examples from the Bible. Zacchaeus, he was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. You remember that from, from Bible school? But Zacchaeus saw Jesus, and he wanted to get close to Jesus, but he was so small, and the crowd was so large that he had to climb the sycamore tree. And Jesus noticed Zacchaeus, and he said, you, come down. I'm going to your house. You and I are going to have dinner together. And even though Zacchaeus was a sinner, he was cheating people for money, and he was keeping it for his own self, he felt the conviction of just Jesus' presence. And he said, you know what? I'm going to give half my wealth to the poor. And if I cheated anyone, I will give them four times what I cheated them on. Just being in the presence of Jesus can change everything. And let's not get me started on Peter. I mean, he cut a guard's ear off. And another time, Jesus looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. I mean, come on. What about the woman at the well who Jesus met and and uh, he began to tell her everything about herself. He said to her, you've been married four times. And the man you're shacking up with, you ain't married to him. But he did it with such love. And you guys, I'm the woman at the well. I've been married four times. And if people look down their nose, you guys would not be sitting in this room. But Jesus loved me right where I was at, that he allowed me not just to be back in his presence, but he allowed me to pastor other people. I believe he loves to use, and this is why Jesus was so hard on the church folk, because he loves to use people who have been somewhere. If you're so perfect, how is he ever going to use you? Because you don't know what other people have gone through. That's why God sent him to the earth. He said, listen, son, I'm going to send you down here, and you're going to feel everything that humans feel. You're going to feel the emotions. You're going to go through the things. You're going to feel hunger. You're going to feel hurt. You're going to feel people betraying you and stabbing you in the back. You're going to feel it all, but you're not going to sin. Jesus had to do it too. And I want us to look at one more scripture. And it says in John 8, 
1 through 11, this woman was caught in adultery. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives. But early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered because people followed Jesus. And he sat down and he taught them. And as he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, the church folk, the ones who thought they were better than everybody else, brought a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. And they put her in front of the crowd with the wrong heart, you guys. And he said, teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? And they were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. And when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until Jesus, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. What would happen, church, if that was our heart toward people that are messing up again and again and again? What if that was our heart? Recently, I overheard someone saying, church people are mean. And you know, don't mess with my people. We're going to fight. You know, I was like, uh-uh, don't be talking about my people. But then I got to thinking about it, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I agree. We are mean. We really need to get off of our high horses, holier-than-thou attitude, and start loving people where they're at. I see so many people walk away from Jesus because of church people being mean and backstabby and gossipy. Let me quote Brian Wilson. Years and years of judgmental hypocrisy has led many people astray. If we focus on what Jesus taught, it would never have happened. My generation and the next several have a lot of work to do. We got to do better. We forget that Jesus loved us in our mess right where we were at, right? Right? And you know, we're all imperfect, and we, I don't know about you, but I don't want my judgment to be the reason people walk away from the perfect one. My prayer the last two weeks has been, as I've been preparing, um, was that today, like I said earlier, that our toes would get so stepped on, not to make us mad, but to make us change. So... Mike, I have some questions as they dim the lights and you guys stand for a little self-reflection time. What would happen if we love and accept others where they're at? What would happen if we commit today to love each other enough not to give up, not to gossip about, and agree to call each other higher. What would happen? I promise you that our love will bring about more change than our judgment ever will. The Bible tells us, you guys, that we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And that's what I always say. Like, I don't have to agree with your sin. But just because I don't agree does not make it that I can't love you, right? So there are, we're, everybody needs to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. So there are two types of people in this room today. One, people who have a relationship with the Lord and um, got their toes stepped on today and was like, you know what? I have been judging people. I need to repent. 
And then there's another type of person. And this person doesn't have a relationship with the Lord yet at all. And I believe not more times than not, people that choose not to have a relationship with the Lord, it's because they're judging themselves, feeling like they've got to be perfect in order to even begin a relationship with God. And that is so far from the truth. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have it all together. We say yes to the Holy Spirit and then he corrects us and he guides us and teaches us. All you have to do is want that relationship. So I'm gonna ask you to lift your hand on the count of three if you do not have a relationship with the Lord. But I wanna make it comfortable for the people that might want to do that for the very first time. So would you guys bow your heads and close your eyes as I ask the count to three. One, Jesus is not mad at you. He is madly in love with you. Two, The Bible says all you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus died for you to save you. Three, hands up if you want a relationship with the Lord. I see that hand. I see those hands. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let me pray for you guys. Father, we come to you today. God, we repent. The capital C Church repents. And Lord, for every hand, you saw it. They're confessing they want you in their life. They're turning over their life to say, God, you can be the Lord and Savior of my life. God, thank you for moving today. Thank you for calling us higher. Thank you for doing for us what we could never do or anybody else could ever do for us. Today, Lord, we say yes to a new day and a new relationship with you in Jesus.